I'll tell you a couple things. I'm, we, had a, we had a little meeting on Wednesday night, a prayer meeting, but it really was more of a family, kind of a town hall meeting for those who came to say essentially this, that we are endeavoring, uh, you know, to shift uh, the focus of our church, not that it's ever not been our focus, but I guess we want to say it better and do it better, to, uh, to something that, that requires you to be involved in more and more of who we are. Um, it's never been our goal to be a, a congregation where there's a, a separation between the platform and the seats that means that there's, there are audience members or spectators and then there are folks who are, who are doing the, the ministry. Um, there is an old football coach who is famous for saying that about college football that college football could be described as 22 men in need of, deep need of rest and 70,000 people in deep need of exercise. And the church oftentimes is like that, that we need to expand out the way we do things. And so that doesn't mean everybody's going to get to preach, because if you're not a preacher, you're not going to preach. Um, but it does mean that you have a role to play. And, and our new season feeling about Maranatha is not just a name, but about uh, believing that the Lord has a desire He's put a personal and non-transferable call on your life to serve him in a way that he is uniquely calling you. If you're not serving the church, um, that's fine. I just want to know how you're doing it otherwise. It, you know, tell me how you're doing it otherwise, and I'll buy into that. But I believe that one of the ways that you demonstrate connection uh, to the church is by serving. And uh, one of my heroes of the faith, a guy by the name of John Wimber, who started what's known as the Vineyard Movement. His congregation, he says he was preaching sometimes. He knew, he's like, yeah, I guess I wasn't the best preacher. So people would say, hey, when are you going to go deep? And his response was always, the meat is in the streets. You want to go deep, get outside of the building. You want to go to the deep places, get out there and be incarnational. Serve people, you know, bring the king, bring the Lord into your life outside of this place. And that's our aim. And so... Um, we're continuing then a series of messages that are focused in, in one way or another on that reality, on the desire to see God come and do what he wants to do in our church, in your lives, in our community, in our world. And the, way, the best way we know to express that is in this word Maranatha. That is a, it, that is a recognition, a, a theological recognition that he has come and done everything that he needs to do to set us free and to make us right with him. And that we are calling upon him to come soon to, to fix everything. But that also there is this here and now recognition that, that, he, that we have all we need. We've been given all the resources we need to establish his kingdom as he desires to see it established. And so this morning, I want to uh, get into maybe what I would call, if you wanted to title it, I'd call it our Maranatha prayer. And so open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. We sang this morning at the very beginning for those of you who are uh, like to be here for the opening bell, which about six of you. um, Brian opened up by singing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel. That is, I, I think if I could write something on the wall that says, how would you say Maranatha in another way? That would be it. O come, O come, Emmanuel. God with us. We are asking him to come. And so in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching. Uh, he's in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching on prayer, and he's talking about people who pray in wrong ways, and he's trying to get it the way, right way to pray. And so he says to his disciples, look, when you pray, here's how you should pray. And he's not necessarily saying, pray these words, although I have no problem with the Lord's Prayer being prayed exactly as it is. I don't believe that was his heart in this prayer to say, you must pray these words this way, and then you'll unlock access to the kingdom. But he is unlocking for us principles of prayer that are, that are absolutely mind-blowing if we get what he's getting at. And so he opens up this prayer by saying, our Father, you know, he's saying, you know, we have to figure out who we're addressing in this. So he's saying we address, you know, 
God, the sovereign king of all things. And we said, your name is holy. It's different. There's no other name like it. And then the very first thing he prays is verse 10. Matthew 6, verse 10. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Those words are the most clear and simple Maranatha prayer that I could, I could, I could find in Scripture. Your kingdom come. <laughs> Your will be done. Um, Jesus teaches us to pray this way. Let me, let me pray, and then we'll, and I'll get into how he does it. Jesus, we pray that your kingdom would come in the midst of this message. We pray that you would let your spirit fall upon me, Lord, in such a significant way that you would say what you want to say, and that I would say very little. And we pray that you would help to divide the difference between those two things, that as your word goes out, that it would be, it would find its mark. Lord, that you would, you would connect as you want to connect with our hearts, that you would call us out of deep, dark places, that you would bring us into that marvelous light. Use your word, Lord. I, I, I claim the promise of Isaiah 55, 11, that your word will not return void. So we offer it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when Jesus, even when Jesus gives these words, I think it comes a little bit, di- well, I know it comes a little bit different out of his lips than it does out of mine. When I say, Lord, your kingdom come, when I say Maranatha, that's a little different thing than, what, than when Jesus says it, for a variety of reasons. And this isn't the base of this message, but it bears saying. When Jesus says, your kingdom come, Jesus is, he's the herald, he's the trumpet of the kingdom. He's the one who's come to announce the kingdom, right? Right. But he's also the king, Right? And he's also the kingdom. Right? And so when Jesus says, your kingdom come, it isn't so much a prayer or a petition that God would come and do something. It's a proclamation of truth. He's saying, kingdom, come. He's not, he doesn't even have to command it because it just is. When he says it, it is. And I, I, I don't know that I, I don't have the time to break down the depth of that, but you just have to understand what I mean. When Jesus says something, when God says light, there's light. God, God's, God creates ex nihilo. He creates from nothing. He doesn't need anything else to make it happen. So when Jesus says, kingdom, come, guess what happens? Yeah, it's the king. When he steps here, guess what happens? Kingdom's there. When, and, and guess when he steps here, it's still there. And it's, he's, it's an expansive kingdom. It's, and, and, but for us... We have to realize this is true. We have this authority, but there is a not yet part of this. Is what we, this is why we pray, Lord, come. Come back. Fix, do everything you want to do. And it is, I believe, the first thing Jesus offers in a pattern of prayer, and it has to be our number one priority of our heart's cry. Maranatha. Your kingdom. Your will. Come. Be done. It's pretty simple to break that down. Just a few words. Yours means not mine. (laughs) Okay? Fair enough. Are you with me? Yours means not mine. And so we don't pray, Jesus, help me establish my rule and reign in my life. That's not our prayer. Right? Anybody with me on that? Okay, so it's simple. Yours means not mine. Kingdom. What's a kingdom? Well, a, a kingdom is... Uh, it's not, this is not just a metaphorical thing. The, the Greek word he uses is a very expansive. It means so much more than just kingdom. But let me just give you a, f- a few of the prerequisites or requirements of a kingdom. A kingdom requires, first and foremost, a king, a monarch, a ruler, a lord, a sovereign one, the one who we all recognize. If, guess what? If somebody comes in and says they're king and we don't believe it, we don't acknowledge it, we don't, we don't, that we don't, think that their authority is what it, they say it is? If, if I come into your home and I say, hey, there's a new sheriff in town. Rules are changing. We're doing things different. You're probably going to kick me out of your house. When Jesus comes and says, thy kingdom come, he comes and says it as the first prerequisite of a kingdom coming, which is he comes as king. And he says, 
This is what I'm coming to do. And so it requires a king. What's the second thing a kingdom requires? Well, it requires a place. A kingdom has to be a kingdom. It has to be a place for this to happen. And, and so Jesus is essentially saying, I, I've come to establish the kingdom. Now, this is a, to break this down is kind of hard because essentially what Jesus is saying is I came for, the, I came for, the, for Israel. I've come for you, Israel. I've come to establish my kingdom here in this literal place. And I believe when he returns, he returns that place because it's, he, he's, he's consistent. He'll come back to the place that he began in. I believe he'll rule and reign from that place. But I believe that, that he says the glory, his glory will cover the whole earth, that he's, he's concerned for the nations. And so the place of his kingdom is the whole stinking place. Or creation is his kingdom. You might look at it that way. Anything, this is the way I would define it in my life. Anything God creates... He's responsible for, and it's his. Anything the king claims he's responsible for, he has dominion over, means he has to care for it, right? Okay, so the third thing it requires is citizens. Requires a king, requires a place, and requires citizens. And so I kind of really want to get into the citizens part of it mostly, but I'll just unpack the kingdom come part really, really quickly. Now, when Jesus says, your kingdom come, and Matthew records it, It's, it's, it's quite a bit different from Santa Claus come at Christmas. You know, Santa Claus is coming to town. It, it, this is not the sense in which Jesus says your kingdom come. And I'll break that down for you, but it's, it's kind of hard to do, and I'm probably going to mess this up because I'm not great at grammar. And this is a little bit of a quick Greek grammar lesson. The word that's translated come and the word that's translated done so your kingdom come, your, your will be done, are verbs, action, right? The action in a sentence is the verb. There's a subject, you know, a, a verb and an, an object, simple sentence structure. And so the verb is the action, describes the action. The action in this, this prayer is come and done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And so those are both expressed in Greek in what's called the middle voice. Middle voice is, this is why it's complicated, because there really isn't a middle voice in English. We don't use this in English grammar. And so it's easy for us to get tripped up by what Jesus means when he says, your kingdom come. And so um, your kingdom come would be as simple as me saying something like, uh, Jane bought a puppy. Your kingdom come. Jane bought a puppy. Jane the subject bought the verb, puppy the object. Jane bought a puppy. But it doesn't really tell me the benefit, you know, what, is it, what does that mean? Who did Jane buy the puppy for? What is the, who's the beneficiary of the verb, of the action? Who does it, who does it either, who's going to either suffer or benefit from this action? And so we would say in English, Jane bought herself a puppy, right? If I just said Jane bought her a puppy, you might even not know who I'm talking about. So we might say Jane bought herself a puppy. And that's the way that we would express something like the middle voice. So I, w- 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 if we said something like this, a Carol goes to church or Carol comes to church, we were almost, it was kind of using the middle voice there because Carol is the subject. Carol is the one, but, the, but she benefits or she suffers from the action of coming to church, right? If it's a good day and a good message and a good word, then she benefits from it. If not, she suffers from it. But when Jesus says, your kingdom come, it's using the middle voice. So what it's essentially saying is, not your kingdom come to benefit us. This is hard. I mean, this, is a, this is something you're going to have to wrestle with. Because Jesus is not saying that he wants us to pray that the kingdom of God will come on earth so that we'll benefit. This is not what he's saying. He's saying, Father... Let your kingdom come and your will be done so that you will benefit. He's praying this for, the, for, for God's sake, for God's benefit. This is the totalitarian regime and reign of God that he wants it all for himself. This is, this is a, 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 so, just say law on that. You might need to wrestle with that. The kingdom comes with deep benefits. The kingdom comes with wonderful things for us, but that's not the prayer. When Jesus causes or calls us to join him in this prayer, he's not asking us to pray that the kingdom of God would come so that we would be better, we would feel better. He's praying that it would come so that it would come, so that it would take over the whole earth. And so 
the Maranatha prayer is an appeal to the Lord to come and increase his kingdom turf for his benefit. And, and so, this is why this is important. The, the reason this is so important is because the, the key to our earnestness in praying and the key to un, us unlocking effectiveness in praying this prayer is not seeing that prayer fulfilled in some way that we benefit from, like we have you know, the, the, the list of, you know, the baggage of stuff that we've gotten from it. The key to this, to, to praying this effectively is submission. The key to, our, to, to praying this prayer effectively is to submit ourselves to God's kingdom, to lay ourselves down and to say, Lord, your kingdom come for your purposes to do what you want to do. And it affects a lot of things. It affects the individual life, affects your life. When it comes, it affects the corporate life. I mean, I don't mean like business. I mean like the corporate church. All of all of our lives together. It, it ultimately affects the world because it is a totalitarian kingdom. That's just it's just the nature of it. And I know that um, the the beautiful thing about it is it's not totalitarian in in an evil way. Like you're thinking of Nazism or fascism or communism or thisism or thatism. Things that are, that that end up in a dictator taking over and ruling and reigning and then destroying your life. But the thing is, is he when the kingdom expands for the benefit of God, it provides for those who dwell within the kingdom. This is the way it works. And the truth of the matter is, is you can't obey two totalitarian regimes. You can't obey. You can't follow the orders of two totalitarian regimes. You have to choose one or the other. Or one of, you know, there, maybe there's ten. You've got to choose one to follow. You can't follow all the, order, all the orders. And when Jesus prays this prayer, Jesus announces the kingdom of God over a hundred times in the New Testament. Fascinating to me that even though he does that, by the time we form creeds in the third century, not once is the kingdom mentioned. It's, it's kind of loosely mentioned in one of the creeds, but not, as a, not in this way. So Jesus says the kingdom of God is here or near in Mark. And, you know, every, every husband knows when his wife says, the, you know, it's time when she's pregnant and says it's time. Every husband knows what that means, you know, time. And Jesus is saying it's time, you know, it's, it's here. The time for the birth is, is here. And Jesus talks about the kingdom all over and over again, oftentimes in indirect ways, in parables, sometimes in very direct ways. But in this case... He's talking about it in, in, a, in, in, a, in a way that we need to grasp in the Lord's Prayer, which is this, that, that the kingdom of God is God's total answer to humankind's total need. He's, he's essentially saying that if we will give ourselves totally to this kingdom, every need we have will be met totally in this total kingdom. And so, man, I was thinking this morning, even as we were singing that uh, Come Fill Our Hearts, Lord, with your presence and the beauty and the power of that song, I just listened a day or two ago, to the testimony of Andrew Brunson. Anybody know who Andrew Brunson is? Andrew Brunson is the pastor, church planter, missionary, who was, who was imprisoned in Turkey for a couple of years. And he was just, he just got out a little bit ago and came back to America, and he was giving his testimony at Wheaton, Wheaton College, and talking about what the time was like for him. And here's essentially what he said. I'll, anybody wants to, to see this, I'll gladly send you a link to it. It's a powerful message. But essentially he said this. He said, my time in prison, he said, I've heard testimonies and stories of people who, who've had these incredible visitations in prison that, that sustained them and lifted them up. He said, my time in prison was 100% completely and totally devoid of the presence of God. I did not feel his presence at all. I did not sense his presence at all. I felt total abandonment by God. And it broke me. Addicted to, to um, anti-anxiety pills and, and solitary confinement. And he says it was not a good place. And he says, essentially, that when he came to the place of going into his trial and he was without sleep and he was just feeling completely cut off from God, that as he was in this place, in this pit of despair, he cried out in his heart, he doesn't even know how or why, I love you, Jesus. I trust you, Jesus. And what he said he recognized in that moment was that the, the secret to unlocking his total surrender to the kingdom of God isn't the presence of God, but simple devotion. A simple surrender that says, come what may, I'll follow you. I trust you. And so, our prayer is, thy kingdom come. Like, Lord, come. You know, do what you want to do. And, and I, what's our true response to that? 
I think, I, I, I can't read minds, I can't read hearts, and I'm not putting this on you as, as, a, as a way to, to uh, condemn. And I'm not even putting it, I don't even know who it applies to, so I'm not going to take it away either. I think our response is oftentimes when we hear this kind of Maranatha cry, this prayer of, come Lord, your kingdom come. I think our honest prayer is, oh Lord, can't you wait a little longer? I want to be me a little more. Can't we negotiate? Can't I stay here in the cell? You can have your kingdom. I'll have my cell. We'll meet on Sundays. I'll go back. And so I want to get at this individual need that this, this, this prayer unlocks of this total kingdom for our total need of Jesus. Your, your kingdom come. When you pray, your kingdom come, one of the places that we're praying that that his kingdom will be established is right inside here. We're praying that the kingdom would be established in our, in our heart or in our splankna, which is a Greek word for our soul, our gut, that we want, it, we want it to be established deep within us. And so in order to get at that, I want to tell you a story that comes from John chapter 3. Jesus has a meeting with a guy uh, whose name is Nicodemus. And it's interesting to me that uh, there's so much that you could unpack here. Nicodemus is a Greek name, but he's a Jewish teacher. So I, I don't know what it all means. I think that Nicodemus is given to us by God as a representative of all people, of all humanity. And that all humanity has this, this simple question, this simple need. And so Nicodemus comes to Jesus because he's seeing the, the, the authority with which Jesus teaches about the kingdom, the, the, the miraculous signs. And he comes and he says, um, you know, Jesus, you, I think you come from God because nobody could do the things you're doing without it. And Jesus just completely ignores. He doesn't say, oh, thanks, Nick. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate the affirmation, you know, because when you are, su- when you are supremely and utterly confident, not like arrogant, but you're just full of real divine confidence, you don't need that. So he just is able to cut right past that to the need, and he answers him. This is how he answers. He says, hey, Nick, truly, truly, I say to you, truly, truly means pay attention, buddy. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again. Again, you can't even see it. That's a pretty astounding response, isn't it? Maybe not to you because in America, uh, somehow we gave way maybe in the 70s, this expression born again to the moral majority and whatever evangelical means. We've given this thing away. So now we're afraid to associate ourselves with it for fear that we'll be labeled as Republican or conservative or something that we don't want to be. And so born again has lost, I think, the meaning. Even when we say, hey, man, I'm a born again believer, people are like, oh, gosh, you know. But Jesus is saying, one of the beautiful ways that you learn to interpret Scripture, particularly in the Hebrew mindset, is that the first way, the best way of interpreting Scripture is the simplest way. And so the simplest way to interpret this is what Jesus means exactly what he says. You're not going to see the kingdom unless you're born again. And I think this is the way Nicodemus hears it. So Nicodemus is like, whoa, wait, what? Jesus says in John 1 that he's, John says that we've been given the right to be called children of God. You know, born into this family, we sang. We have the right to that, not, be, not by human descent or by the will of a human father, but to, but to be born of God. And so Jesus is saying, this is the principle. For you to actually be a citizen of this kingdom, you have to be born into it. And I would say it this way. This is what I think Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. God doesn't want a better you. He doesn't want you to have more knowledge or better behavior. What he wants is a totally new you. He doesn't want the old you to even be in the kingdom at all. He wants a new you. And this isn't something, this is the reason that it's grace. This is the reason he has to come kick the door. 
in. We can't unlock it ourselves. This isn't something we can do. If Jesus had just said to Nicodemus, unless you were washed, you can't see the kingdom of God, then we might think, well, I can wash myself. You know, a, a person can wash themselves, but you could never birth yourself. Which means, I mean, how do we, how do, we do that? How do we follow him? How do we get born again? I mean, there's, there's, there's several keys to it that are not the point of this message, but they're worth mentioning. Repentance. Turning from the stuff in your life that you know is not God's plan, not God's will. People say to me all the time, not, people say to me a lot, I just want to be at the center of God's will. Any of you ever thought that? If God's got a will, your, your will be done. I just want to be at the center of that. And my response is always this. Well, let's talk first about the ways you're not. The simple thing to do is eliminate the ways that you're not. And so turning from the ways that we are clearly not in God's will and opposing is, is you know, repentance, surrender, laying our lives down, death to self. These are not words. These are not things that work well in today's empowerment culture to say lay myself down in order to be my total self is not something that's getting a lot of play on Oprah I don't even know Oprah I don't think does Oprah even have a show anymore I have to find a new person to Dr. Phil is he still around no he's not around either can somebody give me a, a, a who man I if I do that then people are going to be mad at me because they like I don't know just whatever Let's just say Brian has a podcast that's highly humanistic, and, and we're... So Nicodemus says to Jesus, because this is so outside of his Jewish mindset, I mean, if I had time to unpack John 3, I'd talk to you about how, 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 how supremely Jewish this interaction is, Jesus dealing with... Ezekiel and, and dealing with Moses in the desert and dealing with all. And one of the concepts he's dealing with is he's dealing with the coming of the kingdom. What the coming of the kingdom looks like in, in, in the Jewish mindset. And so Nicodemus is going, wait, I thought that I was, already, I was already who I needed to be because I'm a Jew. And I thought I was already, all, that I thought that all these things had already happened. All we need for the completion is for the king, the Messiah to come. And Jesus is saying, no, you're not born of this kingdom just by your Jewish descent. And so Jesus responds to him in verse 5. Truly, truly. <laughs> Which again, anytime Jesus, you know, is saying something like this, look, buddy, I got to make this. You got to really listen. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, before he said you can't see the kingdom, he said, unless you're born of water and spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. This kingdom we're praying for, your kingdom come that benefits him, Jesus is saying you don't have access to it. You're not in it. You're not a citizen of it unless you've been born of water and of the spirit. And uh, it's a little bit hard to interpret exactly what's meant by being born of water. Some people want to interpret this as being, you know, physical birth, being born of your mother um, because, you know, we're, we're, you know, the water breaks and we're born. And that's it, possible, but that's not the probable meaning of this. The most probable meaning of this is uh, it has to do with a couple of things. It probably has to do with baptism. It means that, that, you know, to come into an, to be born of the water is like coming into an outer fellowship, like joining a church, getting dunked for the first time or for the fifth time. You know, um, it, it, it's, it, it addresses kind of the outer fellowship that I've come into this community. For, the, for, for Nicodemus, he might have heard this as mikvah, which was the Jewish ritual of purification and water, unless it's born of the water. You know, I go under the water, I'm made clean. Um, again, I think it's Ezekiel 36 or 37 prophesying about the coming of the Spirit and, and the sprinkling of water. And so I believe that part of what Jesus is getting at here is it's entirely possible for us to be half converted. It's entirely possible for us to, to recognize doctrinally the truth of what it means for God to come and save us from our sins in the person of Jesus and to go under the waters of baptism to, 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 expl to, to communicate to the world that we're following, but to, but to not go the whole way of actually surrendering our lives to Jesus so that he has everything. And I'll, at the end of the message, give you an example of that. 
what he says is if you don't have both, if you've not done both, if, you don't, if, if it hasn't happened to you in both ways, you can't enter. Just imagine for a moment if a nation passed a law that said no one can live there in, the king, in that nation except those who were born in that nation. Some, some nations in the world come close to this. Uh, maybe there are a few in the Middle East that actually say this. You can't become a citizen unless you were born there. And, and, and somebody wanted to live there in that nation, but they weren't born there. It, it wouldn't matter if that person took a name that was common in that nation, right? You can come from Brazil to the U.S. and you can change your name to Jeff and it doesn't, it's not going to make you a U.S. citizen because you've taken a, a, a U.S. sounding name. It, it wouldn't matter if that person spoke the language of the kingdom, right? You can speak the language. You can acquire the language all day long. It doesn't make you a citizen. It wouldn't matter if he observed some of the customs of the kingdom, some of the practices of the kingdom. I actually live my life the, the way that people in this kingdom live their lives. It wouldn't matter if I dressed like those in that nation. It wouldn't matter if I practiced some of the religious traditions of that nation. It wouldn't matter if my parents were born in that nation. Jesus says, not born of your parents, but born of God. It wouldn't matter um, if my children were born there. It wouldn't matter if I had lots of friends that were born there. All that would matter was if I was actually born there. And so Jesus says, I don't want a better you. I want a new you. For you to be a citizen in here, you have to be born in here. Do you want to know why that's good news for me? The, lit- the most simple literal explanation I can give you, and that, Brian, I'm kind of wrapping up. The simplest reason I can give you that that's good news for me is I'm not stuck in my birth. I'm not stuck in who I, I you know, I was born. Let me tell you, I woke up one day and realized that my DNA was rotten. Woke up one day and realized the fact that, A, I was, I'm a, I, I, am, I am wretchedly stuck in my sin. And if the best that I have to do in this life is to get rid of as much of that I can and then give that to God, it's a problem. My DNA is corrupted, uh, let alone the fact that there's literal problems in my DNA. You know, there really are issues that have passed down from generation to generation in my DNA that if I were just going to go on the basis of my birth, Well, I can't help it. I was born this way, God. If I was going to operate my life on the basis of who I was born to be, and that was my, that was the best I could get, I had nothing. And the good news for me is Jesus said to me, Jeff, you do not have to relate to me. In fact, you cannot relate to me on the basis of the birth you had from your parents. You can only relate to me. You can only enter into my kingdom on the basis of being born into my kingdom, being born anew. I can't speak to you, but for me, that, that carries with it so much hope. The answers to the problems of life don't lie in my ability to create a better world for myself. But, it, but in the return of the one who is king and whose power controls the course of all human affairs, that's where my hope lies. I'll give you this story of a guy who I think had to get it in a couple of ways. Brian preached a couple weeks ago about Jesus on the shore of Galilee, Capernaum, preaching a message to the masses and then saying to a select few, he's scattering seeds everywhere to everyone who will listen. But then he says to these these few that he he sees the soil there is pretty good. So he says, hey, drop your nets and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Mark says, immediately they dropped their nets and followed. And so you have the story of this ragtag group of guys who follow Jesus and get taught about the kingdom day in, day out, day in, day out. They see the king. They see the kingdom. They hear him talk about it. They see signs and wonders. They're in it the whole time. And then you get to the very end of Jesus' life, just before his death. And this is what Jesus says to Peter. Simon, Simon, this is Luke 22. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have 
turned again. Now I'm going to give you a key insight here. That word, that phrase, you have turned again, is a single Greek word that means this. Conversion. If Go read your King James. Anybody have a King James here? You have it with you? If you have your King James, look it up. Luke 22, 31, 32. It says, and when, yeah, if you got your phone, you got every version. It, when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. What Jesus prophesies over Peter is, Peter, you're half awakened. You followed me. You've walked with me. You've seen it all. You dropped your nets, but you didn't drop Peter. Lay it down. And when you lay it all down, Peter, and you give me everything, you're going to be used in ways you can't even imagine. I think that real conversion happens at the end of the book of John when Jesus restores Peter. He says in Mark, I have to go see the disciples and Peter. Because, you know, and Peter is really important because if he didn't say and Peter, I wonder how that would have felt to Peter knowing he'd rejected him three times as Jesus prophesied. He'd been sifted like wheat. He turned away from Jesus. And now Jesus, at the end of the book of John, brings Peter aside and he says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Three times he restores him for the three times of rejection. And Peter goes on to, to be the the most prolific preacher in the early days of the church. Peter needed conversion. (laughs) He needed to be born again. So do you. Stand with me. Jesus If your kingdom's a total kingdom and it's for the total self, then I wonder what it looks like when I've only given you a part of me. I've compartmentalized it. I've given you the religious side of me or the spiritual side of me. But I haven't brought to you everything that I am. Lord, this might feel like confusing language to some. What does it mean? How do I know if I've really given myself? The best advice I can give, Father, is that a person would bend their knee and pray, Lord, I surrender all. As far as I know my own heart, I ask you, Jesus, to come and to take over everything. Not just less of me and more of you. None of me. All of you. All Jesus. No Jeff. Father, it might feel like a high bar to live it out. And I'm thankful that you've given us this time, this life, this this long-suffering nature of yours for us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, that we might become more and more like you. We might be sanctified, made holy, crafted into your image. But Lord, I pray this morning for new birth, that one or many would say, you know what, Jesus, I've been half converted. I've dropped my nets and followed you, but I haven't dropped myself. And so if that's you, you come in the name of Jesus.